Why do people want to buy EuroLeague? Hello, Emmett Ryan here, and well, we're talking all today about the way that EuroLeague is seeking external investment. We're going to discuss what's in it for EuroLeague, who's looking at it, and what's in it for them, and what we can largely expect going forward. So we're going to get to it shortly, but if you haven't already, please subscribe. That always is a huge, huge help to us. And yeah, let's get right to it. Yeah, so the, I've got notes here because there's a lot of detail on this one. So we're talking about General Atlantic, BC Partners, and Surge Sports Investments. The last one obviously noticeably being linked with Saudi Arabia. I've all shown interest in buying an equity stake in EuroLeague, which would value EuroLeague at approximately 1 billion euro in total for the whole property. Which, considering the way revenues for EuroLeague itself, because you might go, but the EuroLeague clubs all lose money. Yes, but EuroLeague itself, the actual business that oversees everything, has been increasing revenues. It was a, it's around a hundred million mark uh, per annum it gets in right now, and that makes it a reasonably interesting offer, particularly considering what has long been considered the untapped potential of basketball and basketball marketing across the entire EMEA region, not just continental Europe, and obviously what can be done with that. So the people in, interested in investing at Moment BC, who are UK-based, are the favourites, but obviously Surge uh, could seriously make a big play. Obviously we know the Saudis have invested a lot in sports over the years, in their own football league, into clubs overseas, and into some other sporting events as well. Obviously boxing is another big thing for them. So there's a lot going on there. But I suppose why would they take interest in sports leagues to begin with well essentially the reason to take interest in sports leagues we'll get into your league itself specifically more is that the global sports industry is only growing but more importantly it's only growing in relation to how there are struggles in other parts of entertainment and other forms of disposable revenue so sports obviously continue to gain popularity and they tend to have stable revenue streams and what i mean stable is there's a reliable typically long-term tv deals locked in place and within that, naturally, so if you're investing, you know, well, this revenue appears to be guaranteed, obviously barring some extraordinary market forces. There's a reasonably reliable estimates, at least in terms of tickets and merchandise sales. Now, these obviously vary club to club, year to year, but across the board, across the panel, it evens out. So again, reasonably estimable. And what you would see as an investor there is, well, if it's a property that isn't maximizing its value right now, be it in those TV revenue deals, be it in merchandising and ticket sales, be it in any aspect, really, in how it brings in sponsorship, for example. Again, sponsorship deals tend to be multi-year, so stable revenue guaranteed as well. You feel that you can basically make more out of it. So sports leagues as a whole, we've seen it with clubs a lot, but we've seen lots and lots of interest in buying the entire, uh, say, buying chunks of an entire rights for uh, a league or in football more often than not but in other sports. And essentially, all these investors, these venture capital types, uh, other forms of investment funds, obviously some are what you call a family family house, uh, no, family house, office, uh, they've taken interest because there's a level of stability and what they would see as untapped potential. Now, sometimes it can go hilariously uh, oddballed, like the way Chelsea's going right now in the football, but essentially that's it. There's a level of stability in what's there and a belief in untapped potential. So there are key things to bear in mind as to why anyone would invest in any sports league. So why does EuroLeague want to take on this money? Like if it's already getting in revenues and those are growing, surely it feels it's able to grow organically, right? Well, <laughs> yes. Say that to literally any sports organization in league and they'll all tell you that this is a race right now. And because in order to maximize what you've got, you're not just competing with other basketball, for example. So EuroLeague's opponent is not the BCL, it's not even the NBA. And I'm sure the NBA does not see EuroLeague as an opponent anyway, let's be honest. But what EuroLeague's opponents are, quite frankly, are all other sports in Europe, but also all other forms of entertainment that uh, anything basically that can go for disposable income. And the faster you grow, the more of a share, the more of the willingness of the consumer you can get basically to get on board. So you bring in 300 million from an investment fund, uh, which is basically what EuroLeague is looking to do. And also why there's a competition here, by the way, we'll get to that in a second. And they know that that's immediately some money they can work with, they can book towards essentially building the marketing and the commercial side of the business in order to get more people to want to go to the games. Like the first thing you think about 300 million is, oh, so that's just going to go to the members to cover off the crazy losses that they already have. No, 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 no. Uh, unless they're absolutely crazy, that is not what they're doing because this 300 million should be used to grow. 
like the purpose of that investment is essentially to create of that capital investment is to increase the overall ongoing revenue at a faster rate so basically if you're a millions your league you're a millions well your millions would be also a quick way to make money if you win it if your league is making as is generating sorry 100 million in revenue because obviously profits a different matter entirely the goal with this 300 basically is to get it to generating the 200s the 500s and the billions uh, in revenue annually at a much much faster rate so that's why you bring that in we saw the wnba did that a couple of years ago with its uh, private investment taking a 16 percent stake and that's what i think we're seeing here with euroleague and the stake it's looking to sell is that this money will help us raise the value of the 70 percent we'll retain so they'll still have a controlling interest as well and a very commanding controlling interest of that It'll help raise the value of the 70% of the business they'll retain much faster. And that it'll overtake, ideally, the hundred, the 30% they've lost reasonably quickly. So that's obviously the goal. That's what they're aiming to do. And the way they do that basically involves hiring a lot of people and spending a lot of money. Uh, so like then it's spending it on marketing promotion, on growth in communities, on building up brands, and on making more people feel that basketball and EuroLeague basketball in particular, is where they want to spend their disposable income. It's um, been done many times, and it's worked quite a lot, is the short version of it. Like, you know, th there's always more room to professionalize your product to make it look grander than it is and to make it look bigger than it is, and this is an opportunity to do that. So, no, this money will not be coming in to bring in some player from the NBA on an enormous contract. Uh, don't, don't be thinking that. That's not going to be done to bring in talent. Uh, unless, unless, again... People make some really, really bad decision, business decisions. So the last thing I really want to talk about is what the risks are for all the parties and what the opportunities are. Well, the risks are simple, performance risk. Does the TV market go down right now? Well, I say TV, I mean broadcast market. But TV is a very relevant factor here because, as anyone knows, linear TV is essentially being kept alive by two things right now, sports and news. Now, there's not much you can do. Well, you can do some stuff with news, don't be wrong, but sports is reliable. It runs to a specific schedule. It's appointment viewing in that sense. It's not appointment viewing the I have to be there in the I plan on watching at this time. And that means people are not going to flip through ads. Likewise, at streaming, you know you've got a certain core audience who will watch in a certain way, shape, or form. So that's all nice and straightforward. Obviously, economic downturns could be a factor which could lower the value. So when your league rights of various levels and sponsorship deals go to tender, if it's during a downturn in the market, those investors may see a risk loss there. And obviously, regulatory risks and labor ones, they'll come in interesting no matter who the owner is. That's EuroLeague or EuroLeague plus other people as well. And obviously, competition. Does EuroLeague do well enough to win? Is it able to build a strong enough brand, a strong enough product to actually beat out other sports leagues, to beat out uh, other forms of entertainment? Like I always said, one of the biggest problems for London isn't football. Like football is a huge problem. It's the West End. Like I said, there's so many things to do in London. Why it's so hard to build up a yearly team is you are competing with so many sports and so many non-sports things that are getting people's attention. So what are the opportunities then? Like this sounds like a lot of risk. And obviously EuroLeague's fear is loss of control. But if it's only selling a 30% stake, it will retain a great deal of control in any stake it sells. Well, it's commercialization is the real opportunity. It's finding new revenue avenues, typically with expertise either already in-house at the new investor or more likely a blend of that and bring in people from outside to find new commercialization opportunities. This can be maximizing the revenue from broadcast rights, but also other sponsorship and other ideas like that. International expansion, and really that goes for both within EMEA, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and for beyond of that region, because EuroLeague right now, it's very much a, you know, if you're in one of the t cities where there's a team, it's great. If you're beyond that, it's a huge drop, like really, even outside those cities. So even within the, the home markets it has in basketball, in terms of the nations it's based in, there is substantial room to grow with, that, with the expansion there. Obviously, as well, if they look to get to more teams, they will be able to bring a product that people go, oh, we get to have a yearly team or instead of, okay, we're getting a yearly team. Like That's basically the difference in emotion you're trying to get to change. And again, like you can do more merchandising. Like if you, anyone who's used the early store online has noticed that it's a, a bit pale in comparison to literally any team store. That's an actual area of e-commerce the early can build up very, very quickly. Like, you know, collaborating with all its permanent members in particular is the obvious one, the A license holders, uh, but also bringing in everybody else saying, if you're going to be in early You've got to be able to make sure your shop works through our funnel, etc., etc. And essentially, they can integrate more 
uh, technology into it. So why would they be interested in EuroLeague? And it really comes down to EuroLeague not being worth as much as a basketball league, the top basketball league in Europe should be. And it's a case of they rarely had the income, the capital to do the growth that could be done to do it. Obviously, they've got the partnership of the NBA. They're no longer, from what we can see, battling FIBA. So all the strife uh, is basically not there. Uh, you know, and so there's opportunity to collaborate. There's opportunity to bring on some big partners. And that means there's opportunity for growth because sports rights are only going one way. Like I've commentated on a broad range of sports in my life and content is what matters. Like getting more of that content, the better. And the better value there is in that content, the better price you can charge for it. So it really does get that simple at times. This has not been a very basketball video, has it? We've been doing a lot of money videos lately. That's probably because, well, you come here for something different, don't you, when you come to this channel. And if you haven't come before, please be sure to subscribe. It really does help. We're trying to boost it about. We have videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And yeah, it's been my great pleasure talking to you all today about this. It's uh, going to be fascinating to see what happens with the sale. I think they will sell, just to be clear. Uh, I think the one billion valuation, it's that nice number they can hang their hat on. So I don't think they'll sell the stake if it doesn't involve the valuation being one billion. Uh, but, uh, you know, but I think that's pretty much being accepted by all the contending parties as well. That's an absolute uh, you know, must for EuroLeague. That's like a red line that you know, has to be crossed and that's accepted. So yeah, I think they'll get the investment they want. How they use it, well, we'll have to wait and see. But until Wednesday, I will see you soon.